I am the Senior Director of Programs for the Elizabeth Dole Foundation. We are so excited um, that you're here today to join us for today's Caregiver Community Connection C3 series presented by the Elizabeth Dole Foundation, empowered by our partners at the Wounded Warrior Project. Today's C3 episode, Lasting Impact of Veteran Brain Injuries, is in collaboration with the Concussion Legacy Foundation and Wounded Warrior Project. This C3 episode is aimed to bring greater awareness to head trauma conditions, specifically CTE. Before we get started, I want to mention to all attendees that this session is recorded and will be available in the Guides tab in our Hidden Heroes Caregiver Community, or HHCC, or on the Elizabeth Dole Foundation's C3 website. With all of that said, we will take questions towards the end. Uh, we have amazing moderators, Marianne Della Torre, and Megan Bentley, who will be hanging out in the Q&A box, hanging out in the chat box. Um, so make sure you submit your questions there and we'll make sure to take note of them and answer them during our Q&A portion at the end. Today, we will be selecting four winners uh, from our participants during today's episode. So in order to enter into the drawing, engage with us in the chat, ask questions. Uh, today's winners will receive a free special prize. Lastly, today's episode features closed captioning. If you would like to disable it, go to the live transcript button in the control panel and click disable auto transcription. It can be disabled anytime during today's episode. Now we are so excited and pleased to feature a distinguished expert panel today all on screen. Dr. Nowinski, Dr. Stern, Dr. Hines, and Ariana Del Negro. We're so excited and thank each of them for joining us today. Now, without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Chris Nowinski, who will start us off with this important discussion. Dr. Nowinski is the co-founder and CEO of the Concussion Legacy Foundation, a nonprofit organization leading the fight against concussions and CTE and dedicated to improving the lives of those impacted. An all Ivy Harvard football player turned WWE professional wrestler turned neuroscience. Sir neuroscientist, uh, uh, Dr. Nowinski is a frequent speaker uh, on all these various aspects of brain trauma and these key topics. Um, so Dr. Nowinski, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Uh, thank you for, for, for kicking us off today. Thank you so much, Colton, for having us. Thank you for collaborating on this webinar. We're really honored to be able to share uh, our knowledge about CTE for caregivers. We're really proud partners of the Elizabeth Dole Foundation. Uh, and I'll jump right in and share with you a few slides. My job here is to set the table uh, for the other the following experts. So I got into this uh, because actually I got hit in the head too much. So the Concussion Legacy Foundation was started in 2007 uh, after I suffered a traumatic brain injury wrestling for the WWE that really changed the course of my life and has led to, uh, I would say, about 15 years of pretty severe symptoms. Now I actually feel better which is exciting. Um, but we've always had concussions and traumatic brain injury at our heart. And I'm showing a picture here with the doctor who helped me figure out what was happening to me and set me on that path to getting better. Our mission is uh, to support athletes, veterans, and all affected by concussions and CTE, achieve smarter sports and safer athletes through education, innovation, and to end CT through prevention and research. And our vision is a world without CT and concussion safety without compromise. Um, I do come from a military family. That's a picture of my father. We served in the army. Um, I did not serve myself, but I have a great admire of those who do. And we are very much committed to improving your lives as best we can. And we wanna focus on chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So this is a disease that Dr. Stern will explain in detail. Uh, but it is a disease you probably have heard about mostly through NFL players or athletes. We used to call it punch drunks. It was in boxers. It's a disease, degenerative brain disease caused by repeated head impacts, causes problems with cognition, mood, behavior, and sleep. Symptoms can overlap with TBI and PTSD. We do not yet know how to diagnose it in living people. We do not yet know how to treat it. Those are images that Dr. Stern will explain in his presentation. Why we are more aggressively focusing on our military service population is we're recognizing that there's a lot of overlap between CT, TBI, and PTSD. We are starting to identify cases of CTE among military veterans. Uh, our team at the Boston University CT Center 
published the first case series of CT to military veterans. And we have an urgent need to understand what is going on here and how are those uh, disorders interacting. You are all, I think, very familiar with TBI. Um, and Dr. Stern can explain the differences. Uh, CT is, a, is sort of a different animal. And we're concerned about what we found. We published a, a poster a few years back on nine of the first 11 OAF, OAF veterans exposed to BLAST did, were diagnosed with CT. Eight of the nine were also diagnosed with PTSD. We don't know which was causing the symptoms. Um, the average age of death was 36. So we are seeing this in young people. So we started a campaign a few years ago called Project Enlist. The only way that we're going to really understand CTE right now is through studying the brains of people after they've passed away because we can't yet diagnose it living people. And so I've spent the last 15 years of my life evangelizing for those of us who've been hit in the head too much to pledge to donate our brains to research and have led recruiting on our brain bank that's in partnership with the VA and Boston University School of Medicine. Uh, where we've now studied 1,200 brain donors over the last 15 years. Most of them are athletes, and we just, I'm certain if we, are, if we can diagnose more cases of CTE in military veterans, we will learn how to diagnose and treat this disease, and we will learn how to better support you. And so we're trying to raise awareness that brain donation is needed, uh, and it will serve as a catalyst for research on TBI, CT, and PTSD. I know none of us want to think about this. I know none of us want to think about losing a loved one. Um, but we have to talk about this. We want to have better answers in the future. So the goal is by studying brains, we'll develop effective treatments, we'll be able to support families. So we're trying to create a culture of brain donation uh, among military veterans as we have among NFL players. An interesting statistic is now one in three NFL families donates the brain of their loved one they pass away to our brain bank which is a, a pretty remarkable statistic. This is the Brain Bank team. So Dr. Ann McKee leads all that work. Uh, she's a brilliant uh, scientist who has changed everything we know about CT. You see Dr. Bob Stern there. He helped co-found the Brain Bank in the center and has been a mentor to me over the years. Dr. Robert Cantu, our, my co-founder at the foundation. Um, it's supported by the VA, supported by NIH, has made great breakthrough discoveries, but we need to go further and faster. And it's also informing how we can support families. So there, because this can only be diagnosed post-mortem, there are only about 700 families who've ever been told their loved one had CT. But this is a conference we had with our caregivers in February, where we, we have them involved in a number of studies. We're interviewing them about their experience, learning how, what it's like to be the spouse, the parent, the caregiver, and, and even the child of someone with CT, with the behavioral changes that come how can we best support you? So we are focused on, on that experience right now. So what I would ask before I hand it over to Dr. Stern is that if this is interesting to you, um, you're welcome to sign up or sign up a loved one at projectenlist.org. Share this information with people. If you happen to lose someone in your community, you might think about reaching out to us to talk to the family about brain donation. We welcome you to join Operation Brain Help we are trying to, uh, Dr. Hines is one of our experts in this series, where we talk about all the great ways that you can, even if you've had a TBI like I have, protect your brain health, good habits to be created so you can live a long, healthy life. Uh, we have a helpline, so please reach out to us if there's anything that you need that you're not getting, especially if you're concerned about a loved one having CT and finding a doctor who understands. Um, and, and we're just here to support you. So thank you very much. Mind out. My job is to now hand it over to the expert on helping caregivers live with a loved one who might have CTE. So I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Bob Stern, the Director of Clinical Research at the Boston University CT Center. Thanks for coming, Bob. Well, thank you very, very much, Chris. It's an honor to be here today. Uh, this is uh, an incredible, um, uh, organization that I have been following for so long, and I'm really humbled to be able to uh, present this to you today. Uh, I am going to be speaking about caregiving for the veteran with uh, suspected CTE. Um, I'm going to start off, though, however, by giving you uh, uh, some very, very brief descriptions of uh, what CTE is 
and to differentiate it from other things. Because there's been a whole lot of confusion out there uh, by doctors and scientists, as well as by the media and the public. And it's really important to understand what these various words and terms mean so we're all on the same page. Um, let's start with some definitions. So the first one uh, is dementia. What is dementia? Really how it's defined medically is that uh, someone would have significant problems in memory and other cognitive functions that become severe enough to impair independence in everyday activities. It's not an illness. Dementia is not a disease. It's kind of like having a fever. If you have a fever, what does it tell you? It tells you you're sick. It doesn't tell you what's causing it. It's a clinical syndrome with many different causes, including the progressive brain diseases that eventually destroys brain tissue and leads to dementia. These neurodegenerative diseases are what lead to eventually dementia. And Alzheimer's disease is a brain disease that is the most common neurodegenerative disease that eventually leads to dementia. There's several others like Lewy body disease, frontotemporal lobar degeneration, cerebrovascular disease, and yes, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which is a neurodegenerative disease that is indeed similar to Alzheimer's, but it's a unique disease. It is not a brain injury. It's a progressive disease. It's not that someone has a brain injury and then gets another brain injury and they get worse, and then they get another brain injury and they get worse, and another one and, they get, and it keeps on adding up. That's not what it is. It occurs in people with a history of exposure to repetitive head impacts, including combat military service members. And what's been studied the most, contact and collision sport athletes, as well as others. And these head impacts can result in what we refer to as concussions with symptoms. By definition, a concussion is a mild traumatic brain injury that has symptoms associated with it. But it's also associated with a much, much more common repetitive subconcussive trauma. That is trauma to the brain that does not result in the symptoms of concussion. And CTE is this disease that starts during the time of exposure to those repetitive blows to the head. And it sets in motion this cascade of changes in the brain, including the buildup of an abnormal form of a protein called tau. And once it starts, it continues to spread after those head impacts stop. And that abnormal tau protein slowly but surely hurts the way the brain cells function, eventually destroying the brain cells and resulting in atrophy, the loss of the brain tissue. And this often happens after a, a long delay of years or decades between the end of the time the person is getting these repetitive blows to the head and the beginning of any symptoms. And as more and more of the brain tissue becomes hurt, there's more and more of the symptoms. And those symptoms are based on where in the brain the problems occur. And on the right, you see these pictures of slices of brain tissue after, um, after autopsy, where the brown has been stained for that abnormal tau protein. And it shows in kind of these orders of, uh, of severity as the disease gets worse. Now, when all of that occurs in the brain, there's a variety of clinical features, the symptoms and the behaviors that are associated with CTE. Perhaps one of the most difficult is changes in emotional and behavioral control. Things like apathy or the loss of emotional connection or motivation, but also things like agitation and rage, having a short fuse blowing up very easily impulse control problems, and oftentimes aggression. And what 
this whole constellation of behavior problems is referred to is neurobehavioral dysregulation, the poorly regulated problems in behavior and emotion caused by the brain disorder. And it often occurs early in life, around age 30s, 40s, 50s. But then, then there's also problems with cognitive functioning, including what some people refer to as short-term memory or, or in, in neuroscience referred to as episodic memory impairments, where the person cannot make new memories. It's impossible to get the memories into the brain and store them and then get them later. And so the person has rapid forgetting of information. And they might repeat stories and forget that they ever saw you even an hour later. But then there's also problems with what's referred to as ex executive dysfunction. Things like poor judgment and decision-making, impaired organizational and planning skills, difficulty juggling more than one task at a time, and then also cognitive disinhibition, like acting first and then thinking second. And there can be some other areas of cognition impaired as the disease progresses. And these cognitive changes often become uh, more uh, important later in life such as in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And then it can eventually lead to dementia. And remember, dementia just means it's cognitive impairment that becomes significant enough to have an impact on daily functioning, on independence. That's all dementia is. And in this case, caused by the CTE brain changes. It's not Alzheimer's disease. It is... CTE dementia, and it can easily be misdiagnosed as Alzheimer's disease dementia. Here's just a picture of those slices of brains as the disease gets worse, where uh, we can see the uh, early stages being what's called asymptomatic or preclinical. There might not be any problems very early in the disease when you have these little spots of the abnormal tau. But then as it progresses and more, more areas of the brain are impacted by it, there might be the beginnings of the emotional and behavioral changes. And then as it progresses even further and parts of the brain are destroyed and there's a huge amount of atrophy in this part of the brain where memory, uh, um, memories are, are started to be stored, that's where you can have the memory and executive function difficulties. And then eventually more and more brain tissue gets destroyed and there's dementia. So what I want to um, uh, clarify is what Dr. Nowinski said earlier, we can't right now diagnose CTE during life. Now we're working on it. Um, I run a, a very large multi-center study funded by the National Institutes of Health to try to come up with new ways to diagnose CTE during life with PET scans and, and even blood tests maybe but we're not there yet. And so we can only diagnose it after death by looking at brain tissue with special, um, special techniques. But during life, we know what we think it seems like. We know how to describe the clinical problems and the course of the, of the changes. And we refer to this now as traumatic encephalopathy syndrome. We recently published um, a, a major publication that described all the specific criteria to at least um, be able to diagnose people for research purposes with the clinical syndrome associated with underlying CT pathology. So if I'm talking about CTE today, I'm talking about um, uh, suspected CTE, not real understood CTE um, that can only be diagnosed after death. So being a caregiver, caregiving for someone with CTE can be one of the most difficult of life's journeys. Why? Well, CTE, like these other neurodegenerative diseases, can lead to an invisible disability. Others around you may have no clue of what you're dealing with, what the person with CTE is dealing with, and what you as a caregiver is dealing with. And because there's no diagnosis during life, some clinicians aren't really educated about CTE. 
They don't know how to look at it or even think that it's something worthwhile to consider. CT also often affects younger men who can be large and strong and difficult to deal with. And so there might be safety concerns for the family as well as professional caregivers. And it can strike during the productive years while uh, someone has kids, while someone is working. And some of the problems from CT can lead to or exacerbate abuse of alcohol or other substances and make recovery from substance use even more difficult and relapse more likely. And then the substances themselves can worsen the symptoms from CTE and someone can get stuck in that vicious cycle. And CTE can indeed exacerbate the symptoms of PTSD and or traumatic brain injury. And it can sometimes be difficult to differentiate between the symptoms of CTE, PTSD, and TBI uh, and try to figure out what the cause of the symptoms are. I won't go into it in detail, but here you can see that the shared symptoms of irritability, headache, poor tension, anxiety, depression, suicidality between all of them and these problems shared between having a TBI and then the later life problems of CTE, it can get awfully confusing for everyone. But CT caregivers are not alone. There are 15 million dementia caregivers in the United States, but there's five and a half million military and veteran caregivers in the US. And who knows how many spouses, partners, children, and other, others with a loved one there are who only has the emotional and behavioral control problems associated with CT or with just mild cognitive problems without dementia. So people who aren't diagnosed, but whose loved ones might be serving as a caregiver and dealing with some pretty big difficulties. And remember that there are long-term effects of these repetitive brain uh, traumas on the caregiver, not just the person who got hit. And that emotional impact on you can result on, in depression, anxiety, anger, resentment, grief, fear, helplessness, and hopelessness in the caregiver themselves. There can also be lost dreams, looking forward to a life together with your care partner, whether that person is a, an adult, a parent and you're an adult child or a spouse or a partner, there can be that, that uh, horrible sadness of lost dreams. And caregivers don't just suffer emotionally, but they can also suffer physically from lack of time to do self-care to take care of themselves when, because they're caring for someone else. They don't have time to go to the doctor or even just exercise or to do relaxation or stress management. And that can result in stress-related illnesses. And sadly, there can be intimate partner violence and abuse. And so the caregiver might be the recipient of physical, verbal, and emotional violence. But you are not alone, thank goodness. There is the Hidden Heroes Project. I'm sure most of you know about that. And some of you now are just getting to know about the Concussion Legacy Foundation and uh, the Operation Brain Health, which is uh, part of uh, the project and list. And very importantly is the Concussion Legacy Foundation Helpline. I can't tell you how many people have been provided with guidance, with support, with connection, with referrals by contacting the CL CLF helpline. I recommend it. So what about how you handle things, how you get through caregiving? Well, first with the cognitive impairment, one has to think about how one communicates. And so individuals with cognitive impairment from CTE can have a very different reality from you and I. That's so important to remember. 
Think about someone with a huge memory impairment where the information can't get stored because the part of the brain responsible for storing it is hurt by the disease. And so they can't remember new information. They can't remember conversations. They can't remember agreeing about something earlier or even what they ate for breakfast or that a grandchild was recently born. And there could be problems with executive functioning, things like not being able to think logically or solve problems due to those damaged frontal lobes of the brain. And there may be difficulty thinking flexibly, where the person may get stuck on a thought or approach. There may be difficulty with planning, organization, and multitasking. And so think about what it's like living in this here and now, viewing the world like this. It is indeed a different reality. And so as a caregiver, you have to understand that the person might not even be aware that they have these problems. Because when parts of the brain are hurt um, that are uh, uh, responsible for being aware of neurological injuries and disorders and diseases, the person has what's called anosognosia. And so that combination of not remembering that they were having problems and not being aware that they even have them can result in a, a really difficult time for the caregiver. And so I'm just going to give you a few um, uh, don'ts, a few recommendations for what not to do when communicating with a cognitively impaired person with suspected CTE. Number one, don't argue. There's no reason to argue because the individual might not remember the argument later on. Try not to use logic. What might seem logical to you doesn't necessarily make sense to the person with CTE. And even if the person is unable to function independently, it's so important not to belittle them or treat them like a child. But most importantly, don't expect your reality. Don't expect your reality. Don't say things like, hey, remember when this happened, or I just told you about this, because they may not remember. It may get frustrating for you to say, I just told you something. And don't be tempted to discuss the things that are important that are coming up ahead of time because that might just get the individual anxious or upset or, or excited. Wait until things happen. And don't blame the other person. Don't blame the person with suspected CTE for their difficulties with memory and thinking and even that behavior problem. So those were the things not to do. What should you do with the person with cognitive impairment from CTE? Well, Try to understand their reality. Here's this long list of to-dos. Try to understand their reality. Yeah, try to understand their reality. That's really the key thing. It's not the same as yours and mine. And sometimes you need to redirect the person. And so if they're living in the here and now, and they might be getting upset about something, try to change what that here and now is. Try to change frustration to fun, crying to laughter, lost to found by just redirecting the person. Having a toolkit of things that you can use to help the person just change the focus. Have an old photo album or maybe a, an iPad with photos to try to um, bring something up and have the individual start looking at things that might be fun or interesting and change their direction. Have DVR recordings or old DVDs even of old familiar shows from the, that era that the individual really loves or old sports um, uh, shows or playoff games or, um, or World Series or old television shows, even music. But I know you're saying, well, that's really easy. He's, he can say about that. I have so many things that I need to get done. I can't do anything. That's why I'm so stressed. Yeah, it is easier said than done. But 
I think you can do it over and over again. Try, don't give up. I just want to end by talking about what the most difficult problems are for caregivers resulting from that neurobehavioral dysregulation. What I've heard over and over again from people taking care of or a partner with someone with suspected CTE is this escalating anger and rage. Remember that it's the brain disease that's doing this. And that brain disease can decrease the ability for your loved one or care partner to filter things. And the brain disease activates emotional response centers in the brain. And the brain disease reduces the ability to control behavior and emotion. And underlying issues that might just be normal as part of life might be exacerbated. So stress and distress from problems at work or difficulties from the decline in cognitive functioning, or the stressors of child rearing, or problems with finances might get exacerbated. As I mentioned before, substance use and abuse might get worse. And the old scripts that you and your loved one might have, the old little arguments, might just get out of control. But regardless of the cause, the caregiver, the spouse, the partner deserves to be treated with respect. So I'm not saying just suck it up and just allow the person to be angry, to yell, to be hurtful. You deserve respect. And you actually can control that escalation. You can control it by just not participating in it. And what do I mean? Well, here's my guide to breaking the cycle of escalating anger and rage. This person might be your care partner. This might be you. And yeah, sadly, you might be yelling back because it's so difficult not to if you're being treated poorly. What does this do? It only escalates worse and worse. But if you can remove yourself right at the beginning, or perhaps even before things start escalating with your loved one, then it would be kind of like someone having a boxing match with no opponent. If no one else is in the ring, it can't escalate. There can't be a fight. And so the most important words you can learn are I'm leaving the room now. An important first step is to tell your partner, inoculate them, make sure they're aware that this is what you're planning on doing. And so choose a calm time, not after a fight, not after too many drinks, preferably earlier in the day, not later at night, no TV around, no kids, and say some of these things. I know I play a role in our arguments, except some of it except that maybe you can respond defensively sometime. I can lose my patience or temper with you. I realize I have a negative tone in my voice or sometimes I sound sarcastic. I wanna work harder to treat you with respect and understanding. And I want to make sure that I don't make things worse. And so when I feel that I might be about to escalate in a discussion, I'm gonna tell you, that I'm leaving the room now. Now, doing it is obviously much harder, especially if you're being yelled at, treated poorly, or being accused, threatened, called names, being sworn at. You feel that you're going to get defensive or yell back or respond sarcastically or lose your cool. Then just say quickly, I'm leaving the room now, firmly, not angrily, with as little emotion in your tone as possible to say, I'm leaving the room now. Don't turn around looking back at them or respond to another response of theirs or say anything else. Don't slam the door, don't throw things, just turn around and say, I'm leaving the room now. And yes, indeed, it will be difficult and you'll likely mess it up. Just keep trying. Nobody's perfect. 
but it does work. I've seen it over and over again. And all of this stuff obviously has been worse and harder to deal with during these last two and a half years of COVID. Being a caregiver of someone with any brain disorder has been much, much harder. Hopefully we're getting out of that. And so I just wanna leave you with hope. You're not alone. As a caregiver of someone with suspected CT, you aren't alone. You can indeed improve your communication by remember, remembering that um, the person has a possible different reality from yours. You can indeed reduce that escalation of anger and rage by leaving the room. You can ask for help through these wonderful organizations or just from your friends or family members. You deserve to focus on self-care. You deserve to get some time for yourself to make sure you're healthy, both emotionally and physically. Yeah, indeed, you can laugh because laughter is indeed the very, very best medicine. And you can reduce the stress through a variety of stress reduction programs that you can find through Concussion Legacy Foundation um, and through other sources. And please remember you have reasons for hope. So with that, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dr. Nowinski and Dr. Stern, uh, we are so appreciative of the insight that you brought to this conversation. And we've seen so many uh, chats and, and, and questions um, in the Q&A box. So we really wanna um, you know, appreciate everybody jumping in and asking those questions. And we'll try to get to those at the end at the best we can. Um, but now we wanna move on to hearing um, from Dr. Sydney Hines, who, who joins us today from the Wounded Warrior Project as the Vice President for Brain Health strategy and research um, in, in June 2021 is when he started this role. In this role, he's responsible for Wounded Warrior Projects. Um, uh, 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 sorry, in this role, he's responsible for Wounded Warrior Projects programs, which focus on solutions um, for warriors with TBI, psychological health, um, neurodegeneration, trauma, and co-occurring health and, and medical issues. Dr. Hines has recently retired a United States Army officer with over 30 years of military medicine experience. He's a neurologist and a nuclear uh, medicine physician. Formerly, he was the Defense of a Veteran Brain um, Injury Center's fifth national director. Uh, Dr. Hines, we're so appreciative that you're joining us today. I'm going to hand it over to you. Colton, thank you very much, and um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first, I'd like to just start with thanking the Elizabeth Dole Foundation and Concussion Legacy Foundation. Um, we have partnerships um, that really focus on taking care of warriors and caregivers, and uh, you know we're committed to that. Um, I'd like to, you know, very much segue from what uh, Dr. Stern just spoke about uh, and lead with hope. I think one of the things that Wounded Warrior Project really values is providing that hope. We recognize the commitment, the sacrifices warriors, caregivers, and their families have made um, through armed conflict, through training, um, and we want to be able to offer that hope when hope seems to be lost. And you know, for me, when I when I think about it, and as uh, I remove, I'm more removed from my time uh, from first coming into the military when I was uh, in an armor battalion working with uh, medics, um, and then moving to a hospital and then administrative tasks. Is I, I try to keep this picture in mind, Heroes Highway. Now, it, it has almost all the elements that I need to make sure. I keep in mind when I'm thinking about delivering care to warriors and help to, to caregivers, it, it, we have the injured service member. We have all of the healthcare workers around them. We have the evacuation. So it makes me think about triage and getting folks to the right care at the right time. The only thing it doesn't have 
which is always in the back of mind of every warrior, are the loved ones at home, and then certainly trying to get home. Um, but this kind of makes me commit when um, there's so much uh, mundane things. And you know, just to add a, a, a slight uh, bit of dad humor here, as Bob was going over his uh, things that you don't do, uh, those uh, don'ts are I think, actually very good advice for dealing with people in the Washington DC area and, and politics, um, which um, uh, you know sometimes we get involved with. But um, um, thinking about our, our warriors, what all of those types of things are going on, I think really keeps us center, both clinically and with research. I'm gonna go through a number of uh, programs that Wounded Warrior Project has. They're not the only programs or services we provide, but they're the ones that I work most closely with and I think are, are, are very key to uh, this discussion today. Uh, Project Odyssey, so if you've heard about Wounded Warrior uh, Project programs, Project Odyssey is probably the thing that comes in mind. This is where we take warriors and, and caregivers and family members um, and kind of get them out of their comfort zone, much in the same way the military does when you become um, a, a service member. Um, but then through that process, have uh, workshops and other resources to help you um, become more resilient, to address some of the uh, psychological or behavioral health issues that you, you might be experiencing, as well as you know, developing a, rel a relationship which gets you to other services and other programs that may not be apparent to you, but are apparent to a caregiver or family member, or certainly the staff uh, that um, is uh, um, running the uh, Project Odyssey event. The next program we have um, may be a little bit more um, pertinent to um, this discussion as it was a program that was started to take care of moderate and severe traumatic brain injured or spinal cord injured patients, although we also um, take care of a lot of warriors who have other problems. So after service have developed uh, traumatic brain injuries, uh, encephalopathies, um, so uh, brain disorder, uh, disorder of function of the brain um, uh, can be from a number of causes, but um, viral is one of them. Um, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, ALS, um, and uh, dementias. Now, what we hope to do with this program is to allow the warrior to live as independently as that they would like to do, to allow them to have more control. Um, Dr. Stern was uh, very good at describing those things about caregivers. And one of the things that we know when a warrior needs a lot of help, a lot of it is the care uh, um, falls on the caregivers. And caregivers could be spouses, uh, could be um, uh, children, uh, other dependents, parents. And when you think about the last 22 years of war, if a warrior was injured early on, they're 20 years older, which means their caregiver is 20 years older. And they themselves may have medical problems that make it more difficult to take care of the warrior they so um, um, lovingly want to serve. We can step in and we provide not only services for the warrior, but services for the caregivers, uh, caregiver respite, um, allowing you to recharge, refocus um, so that you don't feel any guilt because of resentment, because of maybe changing your lifestyle, giving you and helping you with um, uh, techniques to handle the stress of taking care of, uh, of a warrior. It's a phenomenal program and we're moving on um, to add even more services and helping folks with estate planning and 
that seems rather mundane or um, but what we want to do is be able to set the warrior and his or her family up for the eventuality of a caregiver no longer being able to take care of that warrior. So um, positioning them so that all of their desires are made now and so that those who are executing their estate will know um, what the warrior um, would like to have happened to. So talk is, is a terrific program in which we provide emotional support uh, to warriors. Um, calls, we are available. Um, it's also a, a great way for us to provide a, a continuum of healthcare and get warriors uh, to other needed programs. We're ability, uh, we have the ability to um, connect with the warriors. And sometimes we're a stopgap, sometimes we're all that's really needed. Um, this started out as a peer support program, but now we have dedicated Wounded Warrior Project staff uh, that deliver um, uh, this care with goals set with the warrior, not for the warrior, um, to get the best outcomes. Now, um, many times when you, you talk about traumatic brain injury, mild traumatic brain injury, even uh, PTSD, uh, there are a number of specialty clinics that have popped up that solely um, um, focus on those issues, uh, those disorders. Um, we've partnered with four academic medical centers, uh, Rush University in Chicago and uh, their nonprofit organization, Road Home, uh, UCLA and their nonprofit Operation Mend, Mass General Harvard, their um, uh, nonprofit um, home base, and with Emory University in Atlanta and their nonprofit, uh, the um, Emory University uh, Veterans Center. And what we, what we started out early on was to provide PTSD, anxiety, depression centric, intensive outpatient treatment. And since that time we've, we've advanced because of warriors needs and to try to again, focus on warrior experience and warrior quality of life, we've added substance use disorder and traumatic brain injury. Um, Operation MEND from uh, its inception also had a surgical component, uh, which I, I won't discuss too much here. But I, I think the, um, the issue is, and it focuses on a holistic approach you know, when someone has chronic symptoms and you can have a visual uh, going back to what Dr. Stern showed, the overlap between TBI, PTSD, and CTE, many times we have a lot of symptoms. Plus, um, when you discuss with a, a patient and a family, lots of exposure, maybe um, coexisting diagnoses. We try less to focus on what is causing it but offering those very helpful therapies and approaches and getting the specialists to speak with one another to provide that holistic approach um, uh, for the warrior. Now, one of the cases that helped us really um, make TBI a more prominent portion of that, um, uh, those intensive outpatient treatments, um, was a study that we did with um, Mass General Harvard. What we found is that, you know, TBI, PTSD, anxiety um, can coexist, may and you know, uh, uh, co-occur, be sequential um, in, in their occurrence. But through this holistic approach, we're able to um, dramatically improve uh, the warrior 
quality of life, as well as decrease symptom burden. Um, if you're on the line and uh, uh, you are a veteran, you're very familiar with triage and this dynamic approach to triage. You don't just triage someone and then um, you know, let them be. You're constantly reassessing. And that's what we do um, here at Wounded Warrior Project. So teammates um, are Wounded Warrior staff focus on, on getting the patient, the warrior, the family to the right program at the right time. And so we have a, a number of uh, programs that I've just spoken about, but what our goal is, is to increase that well-being, um, whether it's addressing uh, medical problems or secondary prevention or primary prevention, really um, um, taking a look at overall health, sleep, pain, nutrition, um, because all of those can play a part at increasing your likelihood for dementia or neurodegeneration down the road. So we wanna um, make sure that we're affecting those things that we can um, and not just assume that there's nothing that we can do. Absolutely taking a, a, an active approach towards this. Okay. We partner with a number of other organizations outside of Wounded Warrior Project. We don't always have to either own the program, create the program, but we can partner with those who have similar minded goals for taking care of warriors and their, and their caregivers. So we, we've um, uh, partnered with Headstrong, uh, eHome, uh, Centerstone. We've had referrals to the Marcus uh, Institute for Brain Health in the Aurora Boulder area but we stay focused on what's the best for the warrior. Now, the great thing about triage is that uh, just like triaging a warrior, we've, we're triaging the triage program and we're focusing on um, making the intake less burdensome and that we can share that experience. Warriors, caregivers don't wanna tell their story over and over. They wanna have to tell it once and that when they interact with other programs, those programs have an understanding of what the warrior has been going through. And that's what triage is currently working on. And um, I'm, I'm really looking forward to uh, um, the success of that. And the final program that I'll talk to you about is the complex case coordination program. Um, if I had to say anything about C3 is that we want to keep people from having to need the C3 program using our other programs because C3 is there to help um, those warriors who are um, really heading towards crises and doing an intervention. So whether it's losing a home, going through a divorce, maybe having some troubles with the law, we want to get them into um, a safe environment, get them into the right program that's going to help them get them stabilized and then also get them into programs that are going to help them um, sustain the gains that they make after that um, very acute um, um, intervention of whether it's an intensive outpatient or an intensive inpatient program. The other thing that C3 does very well is it helps coordinate with the, the VA and other programs that offer services. One of the things that I can say about Wounded Warrior Project and our, and our approach is that we don't deliver clinical care directly. We partner with those who, who do or contract for those services. The strength of us or our, our, of Wounded Warrior Project is that we have that ability to check to ensure those services are delivered and the quality of those services are delivered um, well. And C3 um, 
is at the forefront of that because they are constantly vetting programs to ensure they meet those high standards that we want for our warriors. Um, before I wrap up, I just want to reemphasize the idea is hope. There are things that we can do um, to help warriors, to help caregivers, and that's, you know, you know, where, where we are with Wounded Warrior Project and the programs that I, I spoke about, but Wounded Warrior Project overall. If I leave you with anything, it is that there's hope and we're here and available. Please reach out to us. And, um, you know, if we can't deliver that, you know, what you need, when you need it, we'll get you to the right place, um, you know, at the right time. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Dr. Hines, and, and I appreciate the, um, the information you provided um, as it relates to the programs and offerings from uh, Wounded Warrior Project. I, I'm now super excited um, to, to now uh, move forward um, and, and share um, and hand it off to um, Ariana Del Negro, um, who is a 2014 Elizabeth Dole Foundation care, um, Caregiver Fellow. Um, Ariana is a military caregiver to her husband, a retired Army infantry captain um, who was wounded in combat. Since her husband's injury in 2006, um, Ms. Del Negro has been an advocate in the national movement to increase awareness and resources for survivors of military-related um, traumatic brain injury, um, TBI, and their caregivers. Um, Ariana, it's so great to have you on, um, and I'm super excited to hand it over to you. Could you please share a little bit more about your own experience, about your own um, you know, journey as a caregiver? And I know you're um, very um, experienced on this particular issue, um, given um, past work that you've done either through congressional testimony and different organizations. So we'd love to hand it over to you and share a little bit more about that and, and provide some experience and expertise from your perspective. Ariana. Thank you, Colton. I appreciate that. Uh, I guess it's just because I know time is short, I'd like to hit on some of the points that were discussed today and sort of take a pre present where, where I was coming from when I went through this process. Um, I think that the caregiving for traumatic brain injury is a continuous journey that uh, is transformative uh, throughout time and different periods that following the injury require different degrees of, of support from caregivers. And right now, in terms of talking about CTE, those are those are things that suspected CTE, which I think it's important to always put the suspected in front of it, is to say that we don't know a lot about it right now. And when my husband sustained his brain injury, I didn't know anything about it. And one of the things that kept me sane was psychoeducation, which is critical, I think, to, to everyone in this going through the situation where I had to literally self-educate myself on what traumatic brain injury was, what to expect, including the impulse, you know, loss of impulse control, diminished insight, um, all sorts of good things that really made it, armed me with what I needed to be able to understand where he was coming from. In terms of the progression, progressive nature of the injury, I think that everybody's scared of CTE and rightfully so, because we don't know a lot about it. I think that I'd like just to put some emphasis out there that it's still experimental. The purpose of this um, webinar is to encourage people to have a greater understanding of what's on the horizon, but yet to really emphasize the fact that there's still a lot of unknowns. Um, I think that the, the I think it's a, it's a challenge because the, Dr. Stern's presentation and some of the symptoms that he was listing were so common that I could imagine everyone in the audience thinking, that's my, that's my wounded warrior. That's my, then they must have CTE. And I think it's, we have to be very careful because we don't know exactly how to differentiate different stages of neurodegenerative, neurodegenerative processes. And with that, I'll share the fact that um, my husband, infantryman, um, uh, developed multiple sclerosis. Uh, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis five years ago. Now that was, and it was something we went through Operation Men for, and uh, they attributed to neurotrauma secondary to, um, to the head injury. So there's a lot of unknowns that we, that, could, could come ultimately from a brain injury. Obviously, CTE doesn't, they can have subconcussive uh, injuries, but the, the whole point is that there's a lot of unknowns. So we just need to take uh, sort of the, the bull by the horns, do our due diligence and our own research, reach out to people who are credible and who have the knowledge and experience that, um, that 
we can look to in order to have a better understanding for what we need in order to traverse this course. Thank you so much, Ariana, and, and thank you for, for sharing your um, your journey and your insight there. Um, you know, I know we were, are slightly at time, but do just want to allow um, if Dr. Stern, Dr. Hines, um, Dr. Nowinski, um, as well as Ariana, have any last parting words um, to share with our audience um, before we close it out for today. I would love to just add to what Ariana just said um, so well is that uh, there are many questions still out there. And what the most important thing that people can do is to seek out help, uh, regardless of what the cause is of some of these symptoms. There are treatments for many of them. And uh, that education and knowledge about what might be going on is so important, as, as Ariane said. So seek out help. Don't just expect that things are going to get bad and you know, the person's going to progress and it's all, all over. Think about asking questions, go to your healthcare provider, go to the VA, go wherever you can to get some answers and appropriate treatment. Thank you, Dr. Stern. So, um, and I wasn't sure if anybody else, any of our panel and other panelists had any last parting words. I'd just like to underscore what um, Dr. Stern said, and and then also add, put in a a, a plug. I'd be remiss. I think some of the the best advances, especially with head impacts, um, head impact exposure, and traumatic brain injury, has been the phenomenal uh, research that's been going on. While you know we've known that head injuries have occurred in sports and in the military uh, for years, we've known about um, you know, concussions, um, moderate and severe uh, uh, brain injury. We're still learning a lot um, every, every year what we, can, what we can do. And I think the focus on it, the collaboration among um, TBI clinicians and researchers has really advanced the, the field. And I would, um, I would really tell anyone who's listening, stay um, um, attuned to the CDC's website, um, Concussion Legacy Foundation, uh, Elizabeth Dole Foundation, Wounded Warrior Project, um, Brain Injury Association America, uh, you know, because they're coming up with new solutions and, and how to approach it that I think are gonna bear, bear fruit. And you know, the, the, the other plug, I, I'm, a, I'm a researcher and a, as, as is uh, Dr. Nowinski and Dr. Stern, um, get involved. And I think we're gonna have more caregiver related research um, being made available um, by research funders. And the caregiver's voice absolutely needs to be heard. Definitely. Thank you, Dr. Hines. And uh, we've seen so many questions that have come in in the chat box today. And, and, and I'm sorry we weren't able to answer all of them, but I promise you in, in following this event, we'll make sure to get those answered and then get those shared with, with you in, in, in your way. Um, so with that, um, you know, I do want to again thank all of our panelists, um, uh, uh, Ariana Del Negro, um, Dr. Stern, Dr. Hines, Dr. Nowitzki, thank you so, so, so much for being here today to share your expertise, your experience, and, and, and your um, insight on this particular issue. It's such an important issue. I'm glad we're able to have it today, and it sounds like we may need to do this again because we have a lot of questions out there that folks definitely, um, you know, would love the answers to, so maybe we'll, we'll follow up on that. But again, thank you so much for participating today. We're so thankful for this partnership and, and the many conversations that we can continue to have here. Um, before we sign off, I mentioned earlier, and I promised that we were going to have four giveaway winners. So folks who are our winners today um, are, are Carrie White, Stephanie Owen, um, Robert Gowan, and, and Barb Webb. So if you all can email us at events at elizabethdolefoundation.org, we'll be able to get you signed up and get you worked out for, for your surprises there. And if you looked at the chat box, um, we'll have the email address that you can reach out to us.
Um, so again, thank you all for your time today and sharing your incredible resources with our hidden heroes. Um, if you're not already registered with us at, at hiddenheroes.org, we definitely encourage you to do so. Um, it's, a, it's a very inclusive community for military and veteran caregivers of all service eras. Um, so we definitely encourage you to, to visit us there at hiddenheroes.org um, backslash register to get you started. Um, be on the lookout, um, follow up for an, e an email from us that will include the recording of today's webinar, as well as the specific resources that were shared today. Um, so be on the lookout for that here in a little bit. Um, and, and again, do want to thank everyone for joining us today. And big thanks to our partners at Wounded Warrior Project for supporting this C3 series. We hope you enjoyed today's conversation. Stay in touch. Um, and have a wonderful day. Thank you, everybody.